Great. So let's let's move on to scenario two. And the question is, how has your personal or your family's migration story influenced your life, music making, research, et cetera? Uh, why, Joe, why don't you begin? Okay. Uh, I am Chinese American. Um, I was born in China, born and raised. I didn't move to the U.S. until I was about nine. And after I moved to the U.S., um, it was me and my mom for the most part, and we moved all over the U.S. So I've lived in probably six or seven different areas of the U.S. by the time I was 13. Um, so I would say that the biggest influence I've had, the, the, the migration process has had on me, is that I had to learn to adapt and also kind of become almost chameleon-like. Like this accent that I have is not an accent that I a, came to the U.S. with, but then you, you, every stop along the way, I think I've changed just because of where I lived. And I think that's influenced a lot of how I do art, I guess, music. Um, when I write music, I don't think I have a particular voice. I feel like I'm basically like a Weird Al wannabe, except less funny and more original compositions when I try to. Um, but yeah, it just feels like I all genres are fine to me. And even like adding in elements from different countries, I don't particularly feel worldly, but I definitely feel open to all of it just because I feel like I'm already, my identity has shifted so much over the last 20 something years that I've been in this country. It's just like, oh yeah, that's, I, I don't know who I am anymore, but I also know who I am as what I am currently. Um, so I think that's, yeah, that's the way I would see my, my migration influencing my, my life and art and work. Thank you. Uh, Trisha, what are you? Unmute. I, uh, so both of my parents grew up in Korea during the Korean War and my father in particular, um, he was a refugee. He was born in North Korea in Pyongyang. Um, my mother is quite a bit younger than my father and so her memories of the war are a little different from my father's memories, which are when he talks about them are pretty vivid and frightening. Um, I feel like, as is probably maybe typical of East Asian immigrant families, uh, my family is not very verbal. Um, and in fact, because of that, I, I feel like I don't know that much about their that time in their lives, which was so seminal and kind of informative and shaped them. Um, you know, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, I think it was the same for my paternal grandmother because it was sort of normal for the time, but my Grandmother was a child bride and was married at 16 to my grandfather, who was a widower and in his 30s when they married, which is like, wow. And her stepsons were closer in age to her than her husband. Um, so that's a whole nother like thing that I we never talk about. It's just sort of part of his, our family history, which I, I have all these questions about. And um, my parents immigrated to the US in the 70s and they met here. Um, in particular, in my writing, I'm really preoccupied with the mysteries of my family histories, as well as the inheritance of intergenerational trauma. Um, so I think the way it informs like me as a violinist is that, as with many immigrants from East Asia, I also believe that there was some, um, perhaps not like fully recognized, um, motivation on the part of my parents to have my brother and me learn violin as a way to ensure our place in American society. Um, as we know, like there's the stereotypical Asian who plays the violin or piano. I think Margaret Cho, when she did like her solo show at Carnegie Hall said something like, I think I'm the first Korean American woman to ever stand on the stage without a violin. And like everybody laughed because they knew what that was. <laughs> so it's definitely like a trope. Um, and I feel like uh, we excelled at the violin in the same way that we stereotypically excelled academically. And yet at the same time, a lot of East Asians are still routinely left out of conversations around race. Um, and I think a lot in my writing about this lifelong frustration I felt about somehow being erased, um, not because of any, I mean, in some ways like feeling deficient in like the over competence almost of the fact that we I feel kind of doubly erased by the fact that I'm perhaps too privileged and too like secondarily white like too close to being white but also um, not white enough 
uh, at the same time. So I feel like we Asians are in this strange purgatory of being secondary whites and also not white enough, and which creates what I feel is a sort of double bind of being used and taken advantage of by a system that takes our contributions while simultaneously masking, erasing, and ignoring our stories and our trauma. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany. Um, you know, my, my mother is a Cambodian refugee. She um, came here in 1981 and survived the killing fields. And I've known some, a lot of her story since I was really, really young. And because um, my first soiree into performance as a child was being a six-year-old Cambodian classical dancer, um, I think that a lot of my art making has been centered around reckoning with um, this Cambodian diasporic experience. I also very, I am mixed race, hence my last name. <laughs> and so, you know, I reckon with that a little bit in my creative work as well, thinking about multiraciality and what that means. And especially having been someone that has trained in, um, you know, preservationist cultural production and the politics of authenticity of performing Cambodian classical dance, you know, as a mixed body and, and dealing with um, community and public reaction to, to my performing that thing, you know, or to performing that style of dance, uh, that that has very much shaped my uh, creative work moving forward. So, um, you know, my album very, it's called Cambodian Child, you know, it deals with the, these issues of diaspora, of multiraciality, of trauma. Um, but I think that in my scholarship, um, my lived experience becomes really important because it offers potentially a lens through which I'm able to, um, you know, take in uh, information from the academic world and combine that with my family's experiences, with my community's experiences. I translate those, that kind of amalgam of knowledge into creative work and also academic work. And I think it's going to serve, um, I hope that it serves the academic world moving forward to try to center conversations um, that are about refugees with refugees at the center of those conversations. You know, um, I feel like a lot of our scholarship is about, is white people looking at refugees rather than, uh, or at communities of color, rather than allowing communities of color to um, have their own voice and their own agency and rise up um, to tell their own stories the way that they want them to be presented. So I'm hoping that, or so that obviously my work is this kind of um, combination of my own subjectivity, um, you know, my academic training and of my, you know, creative history and it's fully um, fueled at this moment by the understanding of my mother's history and, and that, you know, kind of positionality of being a Cambodian American refugee. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim. Um, I think probably the strongest influence on my work um, is my family's uh, immigration, migration history. Um, my um, mom, my grandma, and my father came over as Vietnamese refugees in the 70s. Um, and uh, my dissertation research was actually on a, a musical theater genre um, called Hat Boi. Um, in, in the South, it's called Hat Boi. In the North, it's called Duong. Um, but it dates all the way back to the 15th century. Um, so it's a really long tradition um, that kind of went through, um, you know, French colonization. Um, um, kind of a nationalist, nationalist movement for independence, um, a communist revolution, um, you know, the privatization of the economy in the 90s. Um, and then it also traveled with refugees um, here to California um, and is still being performed in Southern, Southern California in the refugee community here. Um, and so when I first started researching, I thought that that was kind of my uh, question, right, is tracing the history of this art form and see how it transformed throughout all these different time periods. Um, 
But then as I got into it, I realized the questions that I was actually interested in were a little bit more broad, but at the same time more personal. Um, I, I, I wanted to know um, what my story was, what my community's story was, um, and why I hadn't really seen it reflected um, in, say, the American history classes that I had taken in high school or even in college or at the Vietnam War Memorial. Um, that memorial very much uh, centers American soldiers as the primary victims of the war with each of their names um, carved into the stone, um, 58,000 approximately, but um, the 3 million um, others who passed away during the war um, are nameless, faceless, don't really have a human story to them. Um, and um, I remember seeing Vietnam War films in Hollywood as well that very much centered, um, you know, um, American veterans, American soldiers as the primary victims um, in that conflict. Um, and so um, at, as I did more research into Hot Boy, I, I realized my questions were more about storytelling and um, how the arts play a role in um, kind of constructing our, our historical memories um, that are, are, can be very contested, especially in, in Vietnamese history. If you, if you ask um, you know, the communist current government about April 30th, um, 1975, um, you know, that's a day of celebration. That's a day of um, unifying North and South Vietnam. Um, but if you ask um, the refugees here, um, uh, that's a day of uh, loss and mourning and darkness um, um, and a day that their homeland no longer existed anymore, South Vietnam. Um, and then, of, of course, the Americans um, see that as the end of the war, right? Um, meanwhile, the refugee journeys are really continuing to this day. Um, it never really ended for, for the refugee community. Um, so I was looking at how uh, performing arts and um, the arts in general can um, maybe tell a story that official written histories don't tell. Um, and kind of live in the cracks um, of those gaps um, in history. Um, and um, even in some of the, the, the silences that we, we have in our own families um, because of the difficulties in, in talking about trauma um, and, and how um, the arts can kind of fill in those, those, um, those gaps. Thank you so much. So in, in hearing your stories, um, what, what struck me is that um, I think in all of your stories, there was a point of change where you, you, your professional work began to be more personal in some way. Do you, do you want to talk about what, what was that? Was there a catalyst uh, that, that sparked this change or yeah. So just, I'll leave that open. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, I mean, yes, my creative work has been influenced by, you know, that my family story for the whole time. However, I didn't realize that it was an important or even relevant or interesting, um, you know, story that, that my family stories were even important until I had an advisor in my undergraduate um, like, you know, during my undergrad at UCLA, tell me, you know, that your stories are important. <laughs> like, you know, that it's cool what you do. Like, you've done Cambodian classical dance, you've done Western styles of dance. You want to create work that um, speaks to not only history, but also your own lived experience. Like, that's really interesting. And it really took um, that professor telling me that I could do this as something that was, you know, or in, in a fashion that was uh, considered relevant and, and telling me to then apply to the Asian American Studies Department for a master's, you know, it took that professor um, for me to realize that I was like, that I had any, that our story could be important in any way, you know what I mean? So before that, I was just like, yeah, I do Cambodian classical dance, like, Everyone thinks it's weird, <laughs> but, but now, you know, it's something that's really special. Um, but yeah, so shout out to the UCLA Asian M department. <laughs> Do you want to name the professor just for the archival record? Yeah, it was Tu Hong Nguyen Vo. So she, she really was the one I sat down with her. I was just lost, um, you know, as someone about to graduate undergrad 
and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next or what I was valued, you know, how, how I could be valuable to the world. And she sat down with me and was like, you know that that's a good story, right? <laughs> so she's really great. She's had a huge influence on me as well. Her writing, just talking oh. with her. And yeah, she's, I think it wasn't until I moved to California and um, kind of hung out with the Asian American Studies Department at UCLA that I really felt um, kind of empowered to dig into my own history more. So I, I totally relate to what you're saying. Joel Krisha, do you have response? Um, well, on my, my end, on the music side, I actually, since I was the bedroom music nerd, and I was so insulated that it honestly didn't really, the identity part of me didn't really come in. So like I was saying with the whole chameleon aspect, I think that was its own thing, but it never really was about my identity as an Asian American um, until I joined the Slants, which basically the band is about the Asian American identity in rock music and the entire legal battle was about identity. So that was its own thing. I would say where I, I think I became aware of the change and the need to represent was actually through film. Um, I, I was also a film nerd, but when I lived in Eugene for like my first year out of college, I got connected with the Disorient Asian American Film Festival, which is, sorry, Eric, the greatest Asian American film festival ever. Um, it's, it's so good. It's homegrown. It's the best, best food, best hangouts and family, family vibes all around. But it's a film festival that, that was Asian American. And that's a very important niche because it's not, Asian American does not get the same love as like Asian films, international films. So being a filmmaker and seeing that need to actually have these filmmakers who are similar to me to even be seen in the first place. Like these films are not gonna be premiering at Sundance. They're not gonna be premiering at any of the other bigger festivals. So to, to need an entire community to help support these filmmakers. And eventually you get a Justin Lin or you get a Yellow Rose, which I saw at Eric's Film Fest this last year. It's an amazing film. Um, but there's a lot of filmmakers that don't even get to that point because they don't have the support. And so that's when I realized, okay, I need to support Asian American filmmakers because A, I, I want support too, but I do feel like there are a lot of great storytellers that don't have the support and I can actually help with that process. So that was my change. Okay. Um, I think for me, uh, the change has come with getting more um, serious about my writing practice. And I feel like coming up in classical music at the time that I did, I mean, I have very, very early memories of knowing that somehow I didn't fit in. Like I was constantly what we call code switching now. Like there was no, there's so, was so little vocabulary or language with which to talk about the things that I think I suspect a lot of us felt sort of like that we didn't quite fit in. Um, and so much of the classical music experience is about um, this kind of idea of a universal, somehow this art form that is, um, it's very problematic, that is somehow uh, elevated to such an extent that any conversations around race and the people that are participating in it and sort of like the colonialist bent and like all of this history around it is like just not discussed. And even instinctively feeling like there's something that was bothering me, I didn't feel like there's any space to discuss it. And I would say that any diversity we're seeing in classical music, I feel like classical music as a culture is still remarkably conservative. I'm really interested to hear more about the Bridge to Everywhere project. I, that's really exciting because I think that that's exactly some of the things we need. Like we need to be able to see people as non-binary, like culturally as well, that like you can participate in lots of different um, traditions but I would say within classical music I didn't feel like there was a space for me to make enough of a an impact like as an individual and because there are so many of us that participate in it it's like I mean we may get to this when we're talking today but like the kind of experience of being um, mistaken for other people and interchangeability was like happening all the time you know within classical music it also happened at schools you know like 
you're just the Asian girl. And then if you're the Asian girl with like 20 other Asian girls, like your teacher will actually call you by the wrong name. And somehow I'm just supposed to take it, you know. But then when I started to write and I went to art school, that was when I started sort of similarly to Tiffany, what you were saying about like, I, I for so long felt my experiences were not valid and that they were like, they didn't, I didn't know how to define them. I knew that they were upsetting. I know there's trauma in my family. I know that there's all this stuff, but um, you know, we don't talk about it. We don't verbalize it. Trauma is difficult to talk about. And then in terms of like, just the lack of inclusion historically for Asians, you know, when it comes to racial discourse, like we're very often left out and, um, so because of those like discrepancies, I mean, even my MFA program was predominantly white, like it really, you know, a lot of creative writing MFAs, that's an issue that they have a lack of diversity. But even still, it was with writing that I found that um, I started to find people to tell me like, you know, I know that you don't think what you've experienced or what you think about or what you want to write about is significant, but it's important. And like, I think it's interesting. So please tell me about it. You know, nobody has in classical music ever said to me, tell me about the experience of what it is to be an Asian woman in this, you know, and in fact, in classical music, I've had people actively push back against the idea that there's any uh, racial bias against Asians. So.